Callisto is a dark ice world, the very last of the Galilean worlds, the great moons that orbit Jupiter. And it is very appropriate to call this moon a world because it is the second largest Galilean moon and the third largest moon in the solar system. But that is a topic we'll come back to later. While Callisto is one of the Galilean moons, it also doesn't quite fit the pattern of Galilean moons, and I mean that quite literally. Io, Europa, and Ganymede, those are moons 1, 2, and 3 that orbit Jupiter, at least among the large moons, have a 1, 2, 4 resonance, which is to say that for every time Ganymede goes around Jupiter, Europa goes around twice, and Io orbits Jupiter four times. Callisto, on the other hand, does not follow this orbital resonance. While it is tidally locked like all the other Galilean moons, that is to say one side of the moon always faces its host planet, Callisto is a long way out from Jupiter and from its neighboring moons, and they have not had time yet to pull Callisto into their orbital 124 resonance. However, give it about 1.5 billion years. Measurements of Callisto's orbit and the slow changes of its orbit indicate that it will be pulled into a 1248 harmonic chain with the other three moons. It's just going to take quite some time. It might be right to say that Callisto is the most boring, interesting object in the solar system. It is boring because, well, look at it. Essentially, this moon is an ice ball. It even looks like an ice ball. A sphere of dark ice that has endured repeated impacts. In the case of Callisto, those impacts are whatever asteroids have hit over time. Where that's happened, the ice on the surface has been smashed, leaving a white powder against its darker surface. You could see a similar effect for yourself if you happen to live someplace up north where there's a lot of ice outside. Just go to a frozen pond or lake or even a big puddle. Pick up a handful of gravel and throw it down hard at that ice. Wherever those pebbles hit, the ice is going to fragment, leaving behind bright white marks against the darker ice below. And that, in a nutshell, describes the surface of Callisto. Though granted, that is a simplification made purely for illustrative purposes. Though, it is fully accurate to say that Callisto is a frozen and inactive body. It formed far out from Jupiter, by way of the slow accretion of a cloud of dust in such a way that its interior never really heated, and thus the moon never really experienced any internal heat nor volcanic activity, and it is too far out from Jupiter to have experienced much in the way of tidal forces, and therefore does not likely have much in the way of internal heat sources at all, and probably never has, which means Callisto has little to no geological activity going on on its surface. You can see that here, its surface is pockmarked, utterly and completely saturated by craters. The number of craters visible on a body is an indicator of how old it is. And given the complete saturation of Callisto's surface by craters, it tells us that this moon very likely has been unchanged since its formation near the dawn of the solar system. And in that sense, Callisto is very interesting. If we could ever put a probe there, or perhaps land there ourselves, it would give scientists an opportunity to study what would literally be a world museum from the beginning of the solar system. Another one of those paradoxical traits in which boringness has made Callisto interesting is it is one of the most undifferentiated, if not the most undifferentiated world in the solar system. Differentiation refers to the settling of denser elements deep within a planet or moon, while lighter elements such as minerals and liquids and gases rise to the surface. Because Callisto formed from a process of slow accretion, it is likely that it lost the heat generated by accumulating matter as fast as it built up. Essentially, the world was always a snowball from its beginning to its final formation. And thus, the surface of Callisto is very likely similar to what it's like deep in the interior. Now, Callisto is a huge moon. It is 4,821 kilometers in diameter. This makes it the second largest moon in the solar system, considerably bigger than our moon. And it is nearly as large as both the planets Mercury and Mars. Though it is also one of the least dense objects in the solar system, with a density of a mere 1.83 grams per cubic centimeter. 
Callisto's low density comes from the fact that its body is roughly half ice. Some of it is water ice, and some of it is other types of ice, such as carbon dioxide ice. And the other half is primarily minerals. There isn't a lot of heavy metal in Callisto. And data indicates that its core is probably made of various kinds of silicates and is no more than 600 kilometers in diameter. As noted earlier, Callisto is a long way from Jupiter. Here you can see Jupiter at center right, and the three yellow orbit indicators are Io, Europa, and Ganymede. Ganymede, the third moon, is just over a million kilometers from Jupiter, whereas Callisto is over 1.8 million kilometers from Jupiter, almost twice as far from Jupiter as Ganymede. That great distance not only makes it too far away to have much play with the tidal forces generated by the first three moons, but it puts Callisto outside of Jupiter's main radiation belt. Callisto still receives 10 times more radiation from Jupiter per day as Earth does from the Sun, but it means as a potential site for human exploration and human bases at some time in the future, and with such a valuable resource as its virtually endless water supply, Callisto might be considered a prime location to establish a base for exploration of the outer solar system. Though perhaps Callisto will become a bit more geologically active once it tidally locks with the other three Galilean moons. However, given that's a good 1.5 billion years away, I think we can put that on the back burner. And for a moon that is geologically boring, Callisto has many interesting mysteries. For one, it has a very tenuous atmosphere, composed primarily of carbon dioxide with a bit of hydrogen and perhaps oxygen. However, there has been no direct confirmation yet of the presence of oxygen. It is so thin, in fact, that scientists estimate that it should vanish into space within about four years. But it hasn't, obviously, which means processes on Callisto's surface keep replenishing that atmosphere. It is believed that the ices on Callisto's surface sublimate, constantly replenishing that atmosphere. Callisto also has a relatively strong ionosphere, with an electron density of 7 to the negative 17 times 10 to the 4th power electrons per cubic centimeter. And that ionic activity cannot be explained by the photoionization of atmospheric carbon dioxide. However, oxygen in the atmosphere would account for this, and this provides indirect evidence for the presence of oxygen on Callisto. Finally, data indicates there is very likely a world ocean of salt water deep under the surface of Callisto, between 250 and 300 kilometers down. However, given the lack of geothermal activity, there would be nothing to replenish minerals within that ocean. And thus, though Callisto likely has water far, far beneath the surface, it is considered a much less likely candidate for extraterrestrial life than moons like Europa, Ganymede, or Enceladus. Even if there were life there, it would be so far beneath the extremely thick frozen crust of Callisto, a world so cold that its ice is as hard as granite, that it is unlikely any probe could ever get down there to study it. And whereas those other moons often give off geysers that may contain valuable clues as to what lies within those oceans, Callisto, geologically stagnant, creates no geysers. And thus it is very likely that some of its mysteries will always remain mysterious. Thank you for venturing into the cosmos with me in this episode of Sky Story. Sky Story is part of the Understory Network, a collection of programs devoted to the study of the natural world, in MicroStory, we study the invisible world of the very small. In UnderStory, we examine natural history and issues of conservation. And in SkyStory, we look beyond Earth and explore the cosmos. There will be many more episodes, so to keep abreast, please take a moment to subscribe, and don't forget to hit that like button.